like a, like a beehive. <laughs> when it came down, and <laughs> two hours, so we should uh, like to do some meditations again, and I won't do the whole thing. Uh, there are some benefits of taking refuge. That we don't need to do, go through it anyway. It's, it's self-explanatory, so no need to go through it. So, but I thought to start with the meditation on the prescriptive and the proscriptive uh, presets, or kind of instructions. And again, to just check, can I integrate this into my life? I mean, that's all we're trying to do, to check, is this something I would like to do? Can I do it? Is it realistic? Okay. And just to take it to a deeper level, such that we can maybe make some adjustments, some changes. Okay, so as before, spend a few moments just focusing on the breath. Then according to the oral tradition, there are three things we should avoid and there are three things we should adopt. So the first thing we should try to avoid is taking refuge in God or spirits and God's celestial beings for the purpose of becoming enlightened or liberated. Instead, we should follow instructions by the Buddha or by the Buddhas. In order not to lose our way, and in order to be led in the right direction, And we should also try to refrain from engaging in harmful actions of body, speech and mind directed at other sentient beings. So see whether there is room for improvement with regard to harmful actions that you could avoid.
we should also make an effort to not allow ourselves to be influenced by those people who hold views that are in contradiction to the Dharma. We should respect their beliefs, not allow ourselves to agree with them or being influenced by them. that they have Buddha nature just like us. But that doesn't mean we need to agree with them. precepts on the point of view of engaging in actions, adopting certain actions. So the first of those is treating images of the Buddha with reverence. Receiving them as representations of enlightened Buddhas. Without looking at their value or the material that they're made of. So even the simplest image respect it in the same way we would a golden image. Allow ourselves to be inspired by the compassion and wisdom of the Buddhas. Likewise, we should treat writings on the Dharma. Books, our own notebooks, we should treat those with reverence. We shouldn't place them we would usually sit. We shouldn't step over them.
keeping it clean and dry place. case of Dharma books, if we want to get rid of some of the Dharma books, to either give them away to libraries, or to dispose of them in a way that they don't become dirty. Without insects eating them, so forth. We should also treat the Sangha with reverence. <coughs> so the people who practice the Dharma with us, to support them. our time, share our resources if necessary. And appreciate that they share this interest and work hard in their own mind. It's also extremely important to treat Israeli monastics with reverence. <coughs> so monks and nuns come from Israel. For them it's not easy to be ordained. Their presence shows that the Dharma is present in Israel. The Dharma as an institution is wherever monastics are, as the Buddha himself said. They dedicated their life to the Dharma, forsaking family, relationships, And even if a monastic may act in a way that we disapprove of, we should still have respect for them. That we 
reason of the fact that they have those files. Really feel that in the depth of your heart and, and make an effort. So keep those precepts to the best of your ability as part of you taking refuge. So there's a huge, there's a really long description of how to be, um, how to be respectful towards the Sangha. You can read about this, or how to be um, respectful towards the Dharma. So this is on page 65, 66, a lot of descriptions. So you can read this, it's, it's self-explanatory how in Tibet, when, when the Kangyu and the Tengyu was invited, so the Kangyu, is the translated work, uh, like the, the Buddha's words that were translated into Tibetan. It's about 101 or 120 volumes, depending on which, um, um, depending on which edition. So these volumes, when they were, in, in, were invited to a monastery, like usually if you see an altar, a Tibetan altar, it has the Kangyur on the right side, of course the right, and then the commentaries by the great masters, the translation of the commentaries on the left. So the translation of the words of the Buddha, 101 or 120 volumes, again, like a bit on the edition, on the right side, and, um, and the commentaries by Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, Buddha, Palita, you know, these great masters, on the left side. And when they were invited to a monastery, <coughs> it was like inviting a lama. Some lamas also in Tibet, when someone carried a scripture past them, they would get up and pay their respect. So it's just paying respect for the written written word. And it's just effective for our own mind. We pay that much more attention if we are respectful. Okay. Um, so that's with regard to the, the, the Dharma and the Sangha also a lot of a lot of description in here. And also, like, oftentimes with monks and nuns, we have these expectations that they behave in a certain way. Um, and of course, sometimes they make mistakes and they you know, behave in a way that is inappropriate. I mean, that happens. It happens, you know, frequently. But, I mean, for me, that's also frustrating as a nun. I mean, like, I'm represented by them in a way. So if other Western nuns in particular behave like that, it's embarrassing. Um, but then I also always try to remember it's difficult for them. It's a difficult style of life. It has great advantages, but like anything, if you take vows and you live a certain lifestyle, it's not easy. So then I find it easier to just deal with it and give them time. And over time, anyway, people change. Um, and here it also says that we should respect the vows, of course. Um, it's not just seeing the person as like, allowing ourselves to define the person by this particular action. And of course we should respect all Buddhist practitioners. This does not just mean our uh, monks and nuns. Of course, most of the Dharma practitioners are lay people. 
So to be very respectful of the people around us. No one is perfect. We all make mistakes. And I think it's important not to simply judge someone just by observing his or her physical or verbal, physical or verbal actions, etc. So therefore, we should make an extra effort to pay less attention to others' behavior and more to our own. Right? Okay. So when there's like, oh, this person is like this, this, this. Oh, how am I behaving? Okay. To kind of, kind of putting the finger, to put the finger in more. It's like we have this habit. Oh, they're doing this, that, and the other. We think about it, think about it, think about it. And then to make a habit, well, what am I doing? Okay, wait a minute, what am I doing? Right? And, and that way it's just easier. And we should train ourselves to be extre therefore extremely mindful of our body, speech, and mind. Okay, because that's the only thing we can really control. And true Dharma practice does not always take place in the peaceful and serene environment of a meditation or retreat. Pardon? Oh, I'm on page uh, 69. Sorry, I'm on page 69. Yeah, I've been jumping a little bit. The, the rest, I mean, these parts, I just noted it. I made a, a note, just because the rest you read it and you'll understand it. So the true Dharma practice does not always take place in the peaceful, but also when dealing with others. So really, our daily life, that's our Dharma practice. And the retreats, you know, like they're a little bit like, um, what's a good example? Um, you know, when you train yourself for a difficult situation, you take some time off to be ready, you know, you sleep well at night, for instance, to be ready to face the next day. So it's a bit like that. These retreats are the, these retreats are, retreats are only tools, tools to face life, to face other people. And even if you're in, dar in a Dharma environment, it, this is like, again and again, I meet people who have these expectations, and I don't say you have them, but it's like, so many times I mentioned that on, 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 in one of the earlier uh, sessions that people think monasteries and nunneries, everything works so harmoniously there, and this is where it's peaceful and that serene. It just isn't. And if a retreat place is serene, etc., well, then there's our mind that we have to deal with, and it's good if stuff comes up. So to not, we try to, we, we have this tendency, of course, naturally, we don't want to experience problems. So we think the Dharma should be free of problems. With our meditation, that's the other problem. When our meditations are, you know, we can focus and we feel happy and blissful, that we would say is a good meditation. But when it's difficult and we are distracted, that we would say is not a good meditation. But that's not true. And there's one problem. There are certain meditations that make us really feel good. They are possibly not the ones that we should be doing. <laughs> Right? I mean, sometimes we can get attached to the ones like just watching the breath, not doing anything else. Why do we feel good? Yeah, because our thoughts, etc., they're temporarily not there. We don't have to deal with them. Our afflictions don't arise. So it's good to do them sometimes and see them for what they are. They temporarily uh, just move us, but we're not dealing with a problem. That's a bit like a painkiller, right? It's like taking a painkiller, we may not be able to deal with the, the, the symptoms, but the moment we stop meditating, they're not really going away. So let's deal with them in, in effective ways. I mean, uh, these are wonderful uh, meditations, they're very important, but there are other ones too, it's not enough. So the example that's sometimes given is, if there's a monster, like the idea of the self, how does the self exist? We should deal with that. We should really address it by just watching the breath. We will not address our sense of self. So the example one of my teachers gave, he's one of the meditators in Dharamsala, so he said, um, if you have a monster in a closet, right, that's like the self. It's not actually there, but we very much believe in it. So if there's a monster in the closet, of course there are emotional states that arise from that perception of the monster, such as fear and anxiety, etc. So we could choose to just take a sleeping pill and go to sleep anyway. Okay? So then for that evening we won't experience the fear. So we can kind of avoid facing it and that may be effective at certain times. But eventually we should have a look. Eventually we should check and really check is there does it really exist the way it appears to me or the way I believe it exists? So those are different types of meditation. Let's not focus, let's not uh, restrict ourselves 
to only believing that just watching the breath, for instance, that's the only way. That is important. It is important. But if you find the meditations we did so far, you find them helpful, well, there is another method. Okay? So if you find it helpful, if not, that's a different matter. It's individually different for everyone. But if you find thinking about these topics, again, taking it deeper, that adjusts your behavior, well, that's what we're aiming for. And we do this all the time. We're doing meditation all the time, by the way. Have you ever noticed how you get really angry? It's a meditation, right? Meditation on anger, literally on anger, you know? Someone says something, and at first I'm not angry. And then I start analyzing. They said this to me. They said this yesterday to me. And did you keep, I remember that voice. I remember the tone of their voice. And I mean, I totally forgot. I really helped them yesterday. And you know, what I've done for them. They never appreciate me. And then on top of everything I've done, they treat me like that. Our mind is totally mad. It's an analytical meditation. Classic. You know? I have this reason and that reason and this reason and that reason. And we, we go over it again and again and again. You know, you can't let it go. Have you ever noticed? You just can't get it go. I'm like, okay, never mind. I have breakfast now. I'm not going to think about it. And then as you're chopping your vegetables, <laughs> there, continue meditation. Continue meditating again. The hurt, and it gets stronger and stronger, and we make ourselves more and more unhappy, and the emotion gets stronger and stronger. Well, at least it works, right? Meditation works. There you go. It works, <laughs> right? I was telling people last time that we can we can actually make our mind believe in the most horrible things, in the most horrific things. This is just the power of the mind. So I give the example, it's a little bit scary, but I, th to me it's just the example of the power of the mind. I was ta t telling people about this documentary I saw about a woman, who, who uh, a, a Jewish uh, girl, who got married in the Second World War to uh, a Nazi officer, the wife of a Nazi officer, it's called. She, she got a passport uh, uh, that was not Jewish, so she was able to, to escape Austria, and she ran away to Germany. <laughs> Went right, and she escaped to Germany from Austria, and there she met a Nazi Nazi officer, and she got married to him. But then eventually he had to go to war, and then if he knew that she was Jewish, but he loved her, so he kind of ignored her. But he was very much conditioned about you know the racial, uh, whatever um, weird ideas they had about race at that time. So he was very strongly conditioned. So, you know, it was this woman and he, she got pregnant. Uh, last time I told her she had a son, actually she had a girl, forgot. So she had a girl, but he was already gone. He was gone. He was captured, uh, he went to Russia to fight the war there. He was captured and came back many years later. And so the war was over. And so she was raising her daughter and the husband came back and he couldn't accept the child. Because of his conditioning, the war was over. You know, the whole thing with the race stuff, it had all been falling apart. It was, you know, not valid. I mean, it's a total rubbish. And so he was still believing in it. So he couldn't accept his own child. He couldn't accept his wife. Uh, but then she took her daughter to England. It was a beautiful documentary. The daughter is very kind of together, very beautiful, eloquent person. And she talked about, it. you know, my, my poor father, he just couldn't get over it. And eventually he died anyway. So, but it showed, I was thinking, oh my God, the conditioning was such that when everything was over, the war was lost, you know, it's like, it was, everyone knew this was just total, bizarre, horrific, whatever, you know, and so actually, therefore, he still had that absurd view. He'd been to Russia, he knew, you know, all the mistakes, everything, the horrific things, and he just couldn't let go. That's the power of the mind, the power of conditioning. So unfortunately, in this case, it's in a negative sense. But the beautiful part of this is that no matter where you live, no matter how difficult it is, you can condition your, your mind in a positive way, right? And there, it's even rooted in reality. In this case, this was not rooted in reality, his views. But we can do this. And we do it all the time, right? We do it all the time anyway, with our anger, attachment. I mean, we do it. We're so good at it. Any emotion. Check your own emotions. How did you get from, from just 
noticing someone harms you to anger. There's always step with your speedy meditators. Speedy meditators. How, how you get attached, when you get attached to a person, the first time we met the person, until the day we feel we can't live without them. How much meditation did you do? If you didn't think about this person, like no way you could be attached. No way. Right? We are very good at this. We can drive, we can brush our teeth and grow attached. Seriously, that's what we do, we take your own mind. So any emotion, we can always remember, we can go back in time. How did I go from A, meeting this person for the first time, to B, can't be without him or her, right? How did I get there? And it's quite easy, we could just have to go, remember, like, how was I thinking? I was thinking in the car, while I was eating, while I was doing, even while I was talking to my friend, I couldn't let it go, okay? So this is how our mind works. This is the mechanic of our mind. Emotions arise through analysis. It's analysis, whether, it's correct or not. I'm not saying this is based in reality. Here you have analysis that is not based in reality. So the same tool, we're so good at it, now we use the same tool where we replace it with realistic analysis. It doesn't make sense to hate my neighbor. Da, da, da. It doesn't make sense to have aversion, etc. I can love this person. He or she has Buddha nature. So use the same. Unfortunately, we don't have the same enthusiasm. <laughs> it doesn't come as natural. <laughs> Like, what? I really want to think about something else. Okay, never mind. You know? So, the same enthusiasm, we don't have it yet. But they eventually it becomes a habit that you don't want to think about anything else. When you think of these great lamas, oh gosh, it's like they don't want to do anything else. I think someone like Lama Zubrimaji, for him, Dharma is always there. It's nothing but Dharma. Uh, this great wonder of his home, and it's not question. I mean, there are these amazing lamas. For them, it's nothing but Dharma. They breathe it in and out, and everything is just dharma. And that's what we're trying to get to. Okay? But we're using tools that are, we're very good at. So this, that's analytical meditation. Right? It's true, isn't it? So to, when we do our practice, to not just do practices that make us feel good, that are easy to do, no, or that are effective in one way, but they don't address our anger, etc. well, let's do other ones too. Okay? So the same way as certain emotions have arisen in dependence on analysis, we use again an analysis in order to generate other emotions to replace them. Let's not get attached to like not thinking anything. Right? I mean, some meditations where you just watch the mind. Very important. We need to just watch the mind sometimes to get more familiar with that. It is important to watch the breath at times, to be just mindful. Very important. But let's, everything is about balance. Balance is very important. Not too much of this, not too much of that, but a balanced kind of practice. And you are the best judge of it. And you become a better judge the more you study the Dharma. All right. Okay, so here it also speaks briefly about the fact that we need to be careful with getting angry because anger directed at a bodhisattva is dangerous getting angry with a bodhisattva, the negativity is much greater than getting angry with just anyone. And since we don't know who is a bodhisattva, <laughs> getting angry is, is, is potentially dangerous. Okay. All right, anyway. Uh, so this is clear. Now, the general precepts. Here are a few general precepts. Um, so again, this is not supposed to be put you under pressure, but just give you a few guidelines. If you wonder, how should I practice? How should I be more? And all of those are easy to do. It's not like you can't do anything else anymore. You can live your life in the same way, but integrate those. And sometimes you may go back and think, hmm, which one have I kind of forgotten about a little bit? Where, where can I, which, which practice can I work on a little bit more? So in general, there are these six precepts which before they related to specific uh, objects of refuge, either the Dharma or the, the Sangha. So here they, refer, uh, they relate to all of them. So recalling the distinction and good qualities of the three, three jewels again and again. So every now and then, you know, you read something, you listen to something. So in that moment, ah, okay, you shouldn't forget the Dharma. That's the quality of the Dharma. That's the quality of the Sangha. 
And as I said, like many times I'm with people that say, oh, I'm so glad there's Sangha, right? I appreciate that. So this is appreciation, appreciation of that. And then when someone said that, they give you the opportunity to remember the importance of Sangha, for instance. And then, of course, with the Buddha and the Dharma. And according to great kindness of the three jewels, strive to worship them. In other words, offer them the first portion of food and drink. This is one of the precepts. So to make a point, they had tried to get into the habit. Just for a moment, I offer this. That's enough. You have to recite a long prayer. You can if you want. But just like a moment, I offer this. And then you <coughs> offer it. And then you drink it. That's already enough. It's a split second. You can make it more extensive by reciting a prayer if you like. In the, I mean, when you're on your own, you can recite it loudly. If you're on, if you're not on your own, you do it mentally. Establish other living beings in this practice and consider them with compassion. Or have other people also maybe to share your your. I mean, to have others to do the same thing. If there's someone who's interested in Buddhism, share that with them. Say, look, this is what I do. It gives me great joy to make this offering. Um, um, to you know, make offerings and of course be compassionate towards them. We've already said that. Aris, did you raise your hand? Yeah, but this it doesn't mean that you need to go out and start propagating. No. No, no, I said only those who are interested already. Like, no way. Oh my god, no. We should not propagate the Dharma. We should not preach it to those who are not interested. But if someone is interested, they kind of take a step towards you and then maybe ask you, what is Buddhism all about, you know? Or what does it mean to take refuge? If they specifically ask about it, and you know what you can tell. The moment you start talking, people very quickly show. You say something and they go, oh, then you stop. <laughs> or you say something and they, and you, they go, then you continue. <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> okay. Whatever activity you engage in, whatever your purpose, teaching is a bit like that. I go through the room and I watch you exactly. <laughs> And sometimes people go, mm, and I know, oh, this is difficult, that one. Okay, need to go a little bit deeper into that one. You know, it's like I watch you all the time. <laughs> you know, there's a nice Jewish saying about it. No, what, what is it? I, it's hard to translate. Do you know what it is? Bar Mitzvah, do you know what it is? Bar Mitzvah? Ah, yeah. It's like a spiritual uh, commandment. commandment? No. No? 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 Uh, so okay, it's, a spirit, it's some kind of a spiritual law or commitment. So okay. they say, uh, as it's a mitzvah mm -hmm. to say that that can be heard, mm -hmm. and say exactly, it's a mitzvah not to say that that cannot be heard. To say the thing that can be heard, but not to say that cannot be heard. Yeah, if mitzvah to say what can be heard, it's a mitzvah not to say what can be heard. If the person is not ready to ah. proceed, yeah, yeah, yeah. then... Yes, yes, yes. That cannot be heard. I see. I get it. Yes. So that which the other person cannot take on, yeah. you shouldn't talk about that. But you should take. You speak about that which is necessary for the person. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Ah, beautiful. Very beautiful. Okay. Good. That's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> so do that. <laughs> it's a Buddhist mitzvah. <laughs> okay. That's a good one. Yeah. Um. So whatever activity, I should learn a little bit more about these sayings. It's so beautiful. I mean, we, I mean, the, you know, I, I liked to, once I listened to a, um, an explanation on the radio, it was after 9-11 and there was so much hatred against uh, Muslims and they invited a few sheikhs and imams, you know, just to, or imams basically, to explain what, what actual, you know, Islam is all about, the peace and how it doesn't actually support terrorism. Um, at least the liberal forms of it, so uh, or the original forms of it. So one person, he, they were asked, what is the meaning of jihad? And he said, jihad is a war, but originally it referred to an inner war, like fighting a war with your own afflictions. And I thought, great, they even have a word for that, right? I fight my own jihad. <laughs> I'm up against a strong enemy. So it's that's apparently the, the original idea. It's not to go out and kill everyone who disagrees, but it's, I mean, it, taken in that extreme way, sometimes interpreting it that in that way to the infidels to kind of be rid. No, actually, the original meaning of jihad is to your inner enemy, right? 
So I think that's very beautiful and you can have a name for that. So why not call Buddha's Jihad? We're also buying our own Jihad. Unfortunately, has this very negative connotation. <laughs> but really, it takes maybe some of the scariness of that word. I it's have my own enemy, Jihad. It's a fight. It's, a f it's not an enemy, it's a fight. Yeah, but it's a fight. I mean, we talk about the enemy, my own afflictions, the no. inner enemy, mm. my struggle. I remember once, I think it was Sorry, Maya, maybe, struggle. I forget. Yeah, like a struggle. I mean, some, uh, I remember, maybe, I forget who it was exactly, but one of my courses, and well, not, I think she came from a Buddhist course from somewhere, she just approached me and she was like, I don't know this language, I'm Israeli, I just come from the army. And then I was talking about, fight your afflictions and struggle, that seems really violent. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not so much about violence as such, it's more like strong measures, you know, like the actual enemy is the inner enemy. So that's the one I should, I should face with strength, with determination, not with hatred, but with determination, like force. I'm not going to allow it to rise. No, nope, I don't want it. So it's, it doesn't have that negativity, it's more like a strength of like a discipline here. But I still remember her saying that, so that's a good point, to kind of tone down my violent language. <laughs> okay, anyway, so therefore, uh, recalling the great kindness of the Sajjabik, Beak, offer the first portion of your food. Um, you can read this, again, I don't have the time to go through all the uh, details, but um, of course it has to do with Accumulating merit. It's all about accumulating merit. So this emphasis on making offerings, offerings, offerings. And like we said before, offering means different things. Um, offering, visualizing offerings, making actual offerings. But visualizing them, that is just as acceptable. It's all about giving, learning to give. Um, and it's accumulating merit, and we need merit, and we need to purify negativity. And purifying negativities, we can also do it by accumulating merit if we apply what are called the four powers, the power of regret, the power of uh, the, the uh, reliance, regret, reliance, the remedy, and the resolve, right? So regret, whatever action I've done, the ones I remember, the ones I don't remember, whatever harmful action, I have deep regret. I feel sorry for what I've done. Uh, and then the reliance would take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Um, and then the remedy would be whatever positive action we do. So if you help in a hospital or you clean your neighbor's garden or any positive action, you dedicate that to as a purification of the negativities. And after the end of the action, you resolve, I'll try my very best to not do this again. So you purify negativities by doing the things you do every day anyway, right? So it could be a positive action, but it could even be a, a neutral action. Right? To every now and then to think this action may purify my negativity. Yes, so yes. the action itself wouldn't purify. I have to, to refer it as a purification. Yes, action. yes. Without the four powers, you can recite, you can do prostrations, you can do the visualization, etc. The good thing is about these visualizations, that's, that's all you do, you totally focus on it. You focus on purifying, right? So if you can, when you brush your teeth, okay, that's something of cleaning. Every time you brush your teeth, you do the four remedies. Five minutes of purification every morning, right? And every evening. So if you're too busy to do it, use your brushing your teeth, having a shower. So to having a shower, you can be you can be focused, you know, it doesn't take that long. Try to save water, <laughs> maybe don't make it too long. <laughs> so, 